Hello, and thank you for listening to Renewables, a podcast by Biostar, which aims to explore the current and future energy landscape in America. Welcome back to Renewables. I'm your host, David Smart, and very excited to feature Andy Posner, the founder and CEO of Capital Good Fund, on the podcast this week. We are in season three. We have some amazing episodes coming your way and really excited to tell you more about Capital Good Fund today, a Rhode Island-based nonprofit social change organization whose mission is to pave pathways out of poverty and advance a green economy through inclusive financial services. So certainly fits the mold of what we like to discuss on the podcast here. Andy, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's great to see you. My pleasure. I I will always accept an opportunity to talk about renewable energy. Awesome. Love it. Well, you're in the right place. Uh, We always start, though, with a little bit about you. Tell us about your background and ultimately how you came to start your business. Yeah, happy to. I have a a somewhat unique story in that my goal in high school was to drop out and be a pro tennis player. I then got a bachelor's degree in Spanish and have an environmental uh, studies master's degree, and now run one of the fastest growing nonprofit lenders in the country. So um, took an interesting journey to where I am today that really started with my interest in the intersection of poverty and race and climate. And then I was doing a master's at Brown in 2007-08 when a couple things came together. The first one is that the financial system collapsed Uh, The second one was that I started learning about international microfinance. And then also around that time, there was a lot of innovation happening in financing mechanisms for clean energy, things like property assessed clean energy. So I I undertook a process of understanding the intersection between the financial system and access to opportunity, whether that's accessing energy efficiency and clean energy or just things like applying for citizenship or placing a security deposit on your uh, apartment and realized that across all those domains, lack of access to equitable credit is a huge barrier and predatory lending is a huge problem um, in the areas of consumer lending, even in clean energy. Like there's been a lot of articles about PACE financing being predatory on the consumer side. So all that came together for me to launch Capital Good Fund in 2009. So I've been running the organization now for 14 years. We now are in 10 states, have over 40 employees. We've lent out over $27 million, about half of which has been for residential solar and energy efficiency. And we're in a very exciting growth phase. That's fantastic. Really, really impressive numbers. And um I guess you, you've given us a pretty good elevator pitch, but expand on that a little bit. Kind of where where is the focus of Capital Good Fund? You mentioned uh, three primary verticals that you sort of serve in the marketplace. Expand on that a little bit for our listeners and viewers. Yeah, so we're pretty unique because we're a nonprofit lender, which many people have not heard of. We are a community development financial institution. I encourage listeners that are not familiar with CDFIs to look into it. Uh, It's a U.S. Treasury certification. There are CDFIs doing really amazing work. In our case, we lend across, as you noted, three consumer verticals. The first one, which we'll focus on here, is our Double Green program, which is for low to moderate income homeowners and homeowners of color who are looking to electrify, whether that's solar, battery, heat pumps, efficiency measures, or home health and safety. The second vertical is an immigration loan up to $20,000 to cover costs associated with applying for a green card, deportation defense, asylum, that sort of thing. And my mother's Ukrainian immigrant. It's a per- personally a uh, big passion of mine. Uh, and then the last bucket is our small dollar consumer program. These are loans under $3,500 that are an alternative to really high interest loans like payday loans and pawn shops and rent to own that have often triple digit rates. And this is where people use the loan for, it could be rent, it could be utilities, security deposits, car repair, that sort of thing. Very interesting. And you've been around, a capital good fund, I should say, has been around for 14 years. So obviously a substantial track record, but you've really seen a lot of growth, really tremendous growth, especially as of late. 
talk about kind of the growth trajectory of the business and um, and why just in the past few years you've you've seen really really fantastic growth. Yeah, it certainly took us a number of years just to get our trajectory going and to figure out a model. There are not a lot of lenders that do low interest loans to low income consumers with less than perfect credit. Uh, it took us a while, like I said, to come up with our business model, the unique way that we acquire customers, service the loans, underwrite them, and so on. Um, but really since the pandemic is when we started to grow significantly. Um, when the pandemic hit, we created a product called the Crisis Relief Loan that got really small, low interest loans into the hands of thousands of families that needed money to bridge gaps. That allowed us to bring in a lot of capital, both philanthropic and debt, to build infrastructure for scale. And then at the same time, we'd been planning for many years a dramatic increase in our immigration and green lending businesses. And we have been doing energy efficiency loans since 2011, but it wasn't until late 2021 that we launched our residential solar loan. And because those loans are much larger, they're about four times larger than an energy efficiency loan. Um, it, it allows us to grow our portfolio more quickly. And then a couple of other things have come together for that business in, to grow spectacularly. Uh, the first one is rising energy prices have and falling renewable energy prices have combined to make this more attractive. Of course, there's the Inflation Reduction Act, there's the war in Ukraine, um, there's more awareness of, of clean energy and the like. Um, so. Last year, we lent out $9 million, and that's up from $5.4 million the year prior and 3.3 the year before that. And this year, we expect to double our loan volume, again, driven primarily by our green lending and also our immigration lending uh, programs. That's fantastic. Amazing growth. And you mentioned the Inflation Reduction Act, which we are following closely in our business, being in the solar and renewable gas development space. Uh, talk a little bit about specifically why the IRA has been good for your business and has helped fuel that growth. Yeah, it's a very interesting time for clean energy, as you know, because while we, I just said that prices have come down, that trend started to reverse a little bit last year, and then there were also supply chain constraints. Um, the other thing that had made it a little more difficult to do residential uh, renewables is that rising interest rates have forced even us as a nonprofit lender to raise our rates. Mm -hmm. So the fact that the solar tax credit went from 26 to 30 percent in a way offset some of those um, negative factors. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing that it didn't do that we advocated for was we wanted to make the the solar tax credit, the residential credit, refundable, because and it didn't. Uh, it was in Build Back Better and it got stripped out of the IRA. And that means that it's still difficult for low-income families to make solar pencil because if you don't have enough taxable income, you can't really monetize the credit. Sure. Um, and we could talk about a different provision of the IRA that, that will allow us to get around that. But I should also mention that there's billions of dollars that are now starting to flow or about to start flowing, including there's the $27 billion greenhouse gas reduction fund, which we expect to be able to tap into for grant dollars for loan loss reserves and building a, a capacity. The EPA just announced, I think, $30 million in environmental justice grants. There's also money from the bipartisan infrastructure bill uh, that we're going to be applying for through the uh, Energy Efficiency Conservation Block Grant Program. So there's a lot of money that's going to be flowing through the system. Grant, low-cost capital, loan credit enhancements like loan loss reserves, in addition to the benefits to homeowners, um, and then domestic manufacturing and all of that. So it's just completely changed the game. Um, but what I'm most excited about is that although... Like I said, the residential credit wasn't made refundable. There is now a provision that says that under the Section 48 credit, which is the commercial uh, solar tax credit, nonprofits are eligible to receive it via direct pay. Uh, to explain why that's such a game changer, currently, when you get a solar lease, the only way for that the company that owns that equipment to receive the credit is through a complicated tax equity structure 
which has high transaction costs, and the investors have high yield expectations. That means that this, the homeowner is losing out on a lot of the savings they would receive if they got the credit directly. Now we can come in, we don't have to have a tax equity structure, we can do a solar lease, you know, we own and operate the system, it's installed on the homeowner's home, we receive the tax credit directly without need for this complicated expensive structure, and we can pass on most of the savings directly to the low-income homeowner. Um, that is a, it's a multi-billion dollar opportunity that can really reverse the fact that if you look at the adoption of solar in low-income communities and communities of color, it's, it's very low and unacceptably low. That's amazing. And um, the timing of this episode is really good because our previous episode is a group called Equitable Solar Solutions, and they actually um, help sort of redistribute and relocate uh, used solar panels that have not reached the end of their useful life um, to you know low and moderate income households or nonprofits. So the timing of all this is really good. And you mentioned loan loss reserves and some of those things. I want to get to that in a minute um, and, and get to sort of the underwriting of this and how you really make you know, a competitive rate given all the challenges that you've kind of outlined. But first, I want to focus a little more on you and kind of where does your interest from the environment come from? Um, and then also, I want to talk a little bit kind of as question B to that. Where does the interest in the environment come from? But then why is it so important to focus on low and moderate? And you've kind of touched on that, but expand on that a little bit for us. I took an unusual route to being interested in and concerned about the environment. It actually started with the war in Iraq, believe it or not. Um, you know, listeners and viewers may recall that at least back then, the, the opposition to the war often centered around this idea of no war for oil. You know, whether or not it actually was about oil, I don't know it, nowadays, but the fact that that was what the protests were centering on, when the protests failed to stop the war, I decided that the next best way to protest would be to try to eliminate my use of fossil fuels. Uh, it didn't take me long to research and learn that I really couldn't do that basically back then. So for the first thing I did was to rip up my driver's license and stop driving. And that just set me down a path of understanding the environment and the environmental movement. And you know, at the time I was more interested in social issues, racial justice, uh, anti-war kind of work. So I was naturally predisposed to the intersection between environment and uh, social issues. And then, you know, uh, I remember Van Jones wrote a book about green, green collar jobs back then, and I immediately latched on to that notion. And to the second part of your question, why I think this is so important, I don't think that you can consistently muster the political will to pass the um, legislation and policies and approve the projects we're gonna to need to approve in order to solve the climate crisis if you don't have the backing of communities. And those communities, it's gonna be hard to get their support if they're not benefiting in any way from all this clean energy work, whether through jobs, through you know glass on their roof, um, because you know, great, we passed the Inflation Reduction Act, I'm sure you and your viewers know, now we have to permit tens of thousands of projects and we have to overcome opposition to power lines and uh, solar arrays and battery systems and offshore wind. And there's a lot of astroturfing campaigns to try to uh, muster opposition to that. So the best way to get a community to support that is if half the houses in that neighborhood have solar panels on them and a quarter of the people in the community are working in clean energy jobs, that's now you've got your buy-in, right? So. Not to mention the fact that, um, you know, those are, that's a huge opportunity. Uh, it, it, you, you could, I suppose, solve the climate crisis just by decarbonizing the most polluting industries and, and leaving low-income homeowners in the lurch, I guess. But it would first be a huge missed opportunity. The other one is that it would create a huge outcry because if you only have low-income homeowners not accessing solar or low-income renters, they're gonna be stuck paying all the transmission and distribution costs that the other, those with solar are not paying. And 
you're going to get blowback. I mean, you already saw that in California where I live. Um, part of the impetus for the net metering adjustment, which made solar less attractive, was the argument that low-income folks were shouldering the burden here because they weren't benefiting. Um, Very interesting. So talk a little bit more about, and you've touched on it, but a, a little bit more about the barriers that prevent people from accessing renewable energy. And, and what what do you mean when you say creating equitable climate solutions? Yeah, um, there are a couple key barriers. The first one is that if you look at who leads uh, and owns, you know, in the companies that do the uh, installation, the EPC um, and the marketing, they are typically upper middle class and white. Um, and so they are not comfortable, adept, and necessarily even interested in trying to reach communities of color and, and lower income communities. One, because that's, that's not where they come from. That's not where they're comfortable. And two, because they're often smaller homes that might be a little more complicated. You know, it's not as big of a project. It has a higher cost per watt, lower profit margin. And they're looking to pick off the lowest hanging fruit, which is a, you know, a bigger house in the suburbs to a borrower with a high FICO score. So that's issue one. It's just selling to these communities or selling equitably to these communities. I mean, there are a lot of people who go to low-income homes and knock on the door and say, free solar. And it's just very, very sketchy. Uh, the second issue is financing. So obviously you're buying, you're not, it's hard to pay for 25 years of power up front, meaning you need financial intermediation. And this is where you need alternative underwriting approaches. Because if you have a lower income homeowner, maybe they don't have as much equity in the home. They certainly don't have perfect credit. Traditional uh, lenders or fintechs don't know how to serve those markets or they don't know how to serve them equitably. I mean, we could go into a whole other section of how the fintechs are charging 40% hidden dealer fees um, and whether or not that's even legal. Uh, but, you know, those practices uh, reduce trust in the sector. The third problem is that it is just incredibly complicated and onerous to install solar. I mean, I hate to admit this, but Capital Good Fund installed a 24 kilowatt system on our roof or had it installed. It's been sitting on our roof for 10 months and has yet to receive permission to operate. And... Now, I mean, it's just been a nightmare and that's not uncommon. I, I have a battery system and solar in my house. You know, we had to have three inspections because the inspector had never seen a battery system. It's a pain. And if we can't streamline that, it's going to be hard to convince people to go through all these hoops. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with, I uh, unfortunately have one that's about 100 times bigger that we had a similar uh, similar experience with it. It can be extremely um, daunting and difficult to deal with the local utilities uh, sometimes in, and the lead times. I mean, you know, they'll, they'll tell you great, you know, looks great, but like you said, it'll be 10 months till you can turn it on. And, and uh, that can be a, a big turnoff. So that makes a lot of sense and, and resonates even with the challenges that, you know, we deal with in the larger scale commercial and industrial space. Um, and you you mentioned underwriting there, and that that's something I want to hone in on here because I'm really interested in, you know, some of the challenges you've already mentioned, maybe subpar credit, um, not as much equity in their home, things like that. So talk a little more about the underwriting challenges, and more importantly, how you solve for those and ultimately keep competitive rates for the consumer. Absolutely. So basically our, our, our approach is as follows. If you have a super prime FICO score, so 720 or above, we just go off of that because FICO is predictive if you have a high score. Uh, right. We do look at you know ability to pay, of course, but that's, that's not magical. Where we have a better approach is when someone has no, well, less than perfect credit, in which case we underwrite based on two main factors. The first one is cash flow in the bank account because the default payment mechanism for us, it, they can opt out, but is uh, most people choose to pay via an ACH withdrawal from their bank account, so an automatic debit. And what we say is, all right, if you 
tend to have money in your account over the last six months and no overdrafts and you have some recurring transactions, that's indicative to us that A, you have enough cash flow to support the payment and B, when we go to make pull the payment, you're likely to have funds in there. Um, so that's a very important factor of ours. And on our green book of loans, our cumulative repayment rate is 99.5% over 11 years. Wow. Um, and the average FICO is about 650. So that is significantly outperforming what FICO predicts. Um, if somebody's banking information isn't great, you know, maybe they've had some overdrafts, we then will look at other things like particularly their utility payment history. So if you've been paying your utilities on time for 12 months and that tells us, all right, since this is replacing your utility bill, this is indicative that you're likely to be able to support that payment. The other key thing though is that because we're a nonprofit and because our capital comes from mission-oriented uh, sources, we are able to be much more flexible in our servicing. Um, you know, in other words, if our capital providers were forcing us to immediately uh, repossess panels, which we would never do anyways, but it, you know, the moment someone misses a payment, that would be one thing. But our capital providers don't do that. We, we structure the deal so they can. That means that if somebody calls us up and says, I'm sick, um, I got laid off, I'm, you know, we will work with them. Uh, it can be an interest-only period, it can be a deferment period, it can be extending the term of the loan. Uh, you know, when the pandemic hit, we restructured about 35% of our borrowers uh, because they needed it. And that's why our portfolio didn't really degrade throughout the pandemic. Um, and then the other thing is that our team comes from the communities that we serve. So we have trust and connection that, and that matters. We're not just some faceless entity calling to service your loan. We're a trusted community organization that's servicing your loan equitably. That's fantastic. And it sounds like creating some good jobs as well. Um, and so talk a little bit about, it's one thing to have a financial product that's available, right? But as you mentioned, installing solar systems is not easy. There's hoops to jump through. There's equipment to procure and labor to procure. So talk a little bit about how you actually get this product into the market. You know, how do folks find you? And then from there, how do they get it on the roof and interconnected and plugged in so they can start saving money? Yeah, that's a great question because that's really where the rubber meets the road. So um, th there are two ways. The, the first one is fairly traditional in that we partner with solar installers and we train their staff to refer people to us who for a couple of reasons might not want to go with a, a fintech like a good leap or a local credit union. Um, the first reason is that they get denied or not just don't meet the eligibility criteria. The second reason is they don't want to pay the 20 to 40% dealer fee. Uh, or the third one is that they prefer to work with a community organization. Now, I will say the downside of our model is that, you know, with a good leap, you can click a button and practically close your loan. So for some people and some installers, in some circumstances, they're just not going to refer to us because ours takes a couple days. And if you're worried about leaving the home and losing the deal, you're not going to send to us. And that's fine. Um, and again, we're also focused more on the folks that are have harder a harder time accessing credit. But for the right consumer and the right installer partner, they love our product uh, and they're going to make that referral. The other approach that we have is what we call an energy concierge model. So here we will have, we'll acquire our own customer and then we have a concierge who will use Aurora solar software to actually design a system. And then we will hand it to the installer for the EPC and we've negotiated lower rates because we're basically taking out their customer acquisition line item. And that's a model we've been piloting very successfully and are looking to scale that up uh, in the coming months. Because I think the, 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 if I were to say what's not going great about the program so far, and we, we already completed a pilot, we've done about 90 solar loans for four and a half million dollars. Only half of the, lo the loans so far have gone to low income folks which is much better than the industry, but not where I want to be. So it's going to be the concierge that helps us do that ourselves because we're directly doing outreach to communities. But also the solar leasing is really where I see us dramatically increasing the percentage of, of customers that are low income. 
how do you solve for folks who don't own a home for renters? And one thing that comes to mind, and actually we, we discussed in the previous episode, which I always encourage our listeners and viewers to go check out as well. Um, you know, we talked about community solar programs and how uh, those are picking up traction, it seems, a little bit around the country. So that's one idea. But how do you solve, um, and feel free to expand on community solar, I'm sure you're paying attention to that. How do you solve for folks that, that don't own a home or that rent uh, and don't have you know the means or the ability to to buy their own home. That is a great question and a huge issue. So the answer is that currently we don't solve for that. Currently we're just focusing on uh, one to four unit homes that are owner occupied. However, and, and were it not for the Inflation Reduction Act, that's probably where it would end. Mm. But because of this direct pay provision and the, the leasing program that we're launching, it opens the door for us in phase two, but it isn't our plan to do this in phase two, to offer a lease for uh, community facilities, uh, affordable housing facilities, and also community solar. So for example, we're talking to some groups that do work on uh, native land where community solar, there's a lot of land and you could do ground mounted solar and there's huge need for access to that. Uh, there are other CDFIs that we can partner with um, as well for community solar projects. So that's me coming. And the other thing, in addition to the direct pay, is the adders. Um, if we locate a community solar project in an energy community, now we're looking at a 40% ITC that can make almost any project anywhere pencil out. Um, yeah. That's great. And then just you're, you're, you're obviously a vocal supporter of legislation that makes sustainability and renewable energy more accessible. You touched on some additional pieces of legislation kind of at the top of the show. Um, where, where are you focused on right now? It's okay if it's a repeat of, of what you said earlier, because I think it's really important. What legislation besides the IRA, you know, either at the local or state or federal level, are you tracking currently? And do you see as important um, to being able to complete your mission or, or further your mission? Well, with Republican control of the House, I'm, I'm not even going to try to, at this point, it's just making sure they don't overturn any aspects of the IRA. So I'm, I'm, I've, I'm not looking at federal legislation for the next two years. Um, what I'm focused on right now is more local and state action. So for example, there's the National Renewable Energy Lab has their Solar App Plus software, which is open source and free for jurisdictions and really streamlines the permitting process. Very few jurisdictions use it, and we're trying to work with cities and towns to get them to adopt it. Uh, the other thing there is, for example, in Georgia, we put in a letter of support for the uh, Public Utilities Commission there, which has a different name, but um, to advocate for a better solar buyback. They, they don't have net metering. But we did put in a letter of support to at least increase the buyback rate, the, the, the cost per KWH for energy sent back to the grid. And they did increase it by like, I think, two and a half uh, cents a kilowatt hour. So things like that. Um, we're also very interested in pathways for community members to get jobs, good paying jobs in the sector and encouraging the growth of local owned, especially minority owned installers and contractors, you know, whether they're eight, not just solar, but there's also, you know, heat pump installers and weatherization contractors and the like. Um, and then there's things like, you know, renewable uh, portfolio standards and at the local level, you know, gas bans and, and all of those sorts of things. So we're, the, the, the key, of course, is just with our limited resources to identify those areas where we think our voice will have the most impact. Um, you know, so for example, in that Georgia rate case, we were able to come in and say, hey, if you increase the buyback, we can increase the adoption of solar among low-income folks. And, you know, that may have resonated. It's tough to know. Sure. You mentioned gas bans. I have to ask. Um, so, you know, I'm a sort of an all-the-above guy. I think the tra energy transition is going to take some time, not something that happens overnight. And I, we, we try not to get overly political on the show, but it's an important topic and it's timely right now. It's been in the news lately. 
or do you support gas bans and sort of pushing electrification or what's your take on that? Um, I support pushing electrification provided that it's done in a way that actually is feasible. I think that often these policies are implemented by people who don't understand the cost and uh, permitting and other constraints we've talked about to doing it. So sure. the, the thing you don't want to do is to say you can't have gas in your home, but to make it very difficult to install a 240 amp outlet and too expensive to buy, put in the induction stove and that sort of thing. So poorly implemented gas bans are, are going to backfire. Um, and I don't know that I've seen a city necessarily implement it the right way yet. Um, because, I mean, for example, one of the things that doesn't come out in these debates is, yes, induction cooktops are great. I have one. But you also have to buy new cookware. And if right. you're low income, where's the money to, to buy the cookware going to come from? Sure. So I think sure. an understanding of those things is definitely missing in the debate. And also, I think it's a, it, it, it was, I, I think we've played into the hands of people who are just looking for a way to delay action on climate by saying we want to do a, a, a ban on, on new gas stoves, I think we need to make the alternative so attractive that sure. it's just what people default to. Sure. Well, good to have folks like you who, uh, you know, read further than the headline out there um, trying to, you know, support and um, help enact these, these types of policies in a common sense way that, like you said, doesn't leave anybody behind. So what are you most excited about with your business right now? You obviously have a, a tremendous growth opportunity in front of you. What excites you the most right now? Or as you look into the next five years, what's the most um, exciting part about Capital Good Fund? Yeah, I think like I, I started to talk about earlier, the benefits of the IRA are only now starting to be felt. Um, IRS is promulgating guidance on a whole number of things. So we don't yet know the full extent of the good that we'll be able to do with the dollars. But I'm extremely excited about the opportunity for us to launch a solar leasing program at scale to solve those areas where, you know, traditional market-based uh, forces don't really work. You know, for example, electrifying homes on Navajo lands that don't even have access to the grid right now, or working in Puerto Rico for folks that are in the same position, um, or just increasing the adoption of batteries for underserved homeowners. Um, yeah, I, I, that to me is just such an exciting opportunity. Um, and the fact that we're in a position to lead that is just, I, I've kind of dreamt of it for 14 years. And the fact that we're at this moment of implementation um, is kind of a dream come true. That's fantastic. It's been really great to get to know you, Andy. I look forward to following along uh, with your journey and, and seeing um, how you continue to grow Capital Good Fund. What you're doing is amazing. Uh, tell our listeners and viewers how they can follow along as well. How can they find you online or reach out uh, to keep in touch and, and follow along with what you're up to? Yeah, absolutely. I encourage folks to go to capitalgoodfund.org. We're also on you know, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. You can just search for us. And I would say we're looking for folks that are interested in investing in our loan fund. You know, We do borrow the money that, that funds our, our uh, product projects. Uh, looking for grants and donations, board members, advisors. If you have expertise in the sector and want to be an advisor, a board member, or just get on the phone, uh, please reach out to me. Maybe you can put my contact info in the show notes. Um, Absolutely. Anyone and anyone that wants to help us advance our mission, I will talk to. Excellent. We definitely will include uh, what information we have in the show notes, your contact information, and of course, your website. Uh, thank you again for coming on the show. Like I said, it's been a real pleasure getting to know you and learning about this amazing company. This has been another episode of Renewables. I'm your host, David Smart. We are digging into season three and really, really excited about uh, this episode and all the episodes ahead this season. So please click that follow button if you haven't already so you never miss an episode. Andy, thanks again and uh, hope to have you back at some point. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. It was a pleasure. 
Hello, and thank you for listening to Renewables, a podcast by Biostar, which aims to explore the current and future energy landscape in America.